How's it, folks? Wow. <laughs> That's right. Sa- we are doing this entire episode in South African accents. Oh, right. <laughs> Welcome to Heavy Hands. I don't know. The vowel sounds get away. I thought it was going to be hens. Heavy, <laughs> heavy hens. <laughs> <laughs> the Afrikaner vowel sounds get away from one very quickly, don't they? Mm-hmm. A- anyway, this is Heavy Hands, and uh, the reason for that incredibly awkward intro is, of course, that this episode is all about UFC 297, featuring a middleweight title clash between defending champion Sean Strickland and best bad fighter of all time, Drikus. Duplessis. I'm Connor Rebush. Oh my god. That's Phil McKenzie. Phil, are you ready for one of the most awkward title fights you will ever have the chance to see? I am actually genuinely very excited for this. It's as as we've said before, it's like the apotheosis of middleweight. Because yeah. it's the the true face of middleweight being revealed to us all. Yeah. So there's always been some trickster god at the top of middleweight, or like, or sometimes more than one. Like yeah. a bunch of really good, really impressive, genuinely, like, you're like, wow, these people would be good in any weight class kind of fighters Yep. at the top. And then there's just been a whole bunch of guys. A whole bunch of guys and, like, athletes who aren't good at stuff. Yep. And finally, like... We don't have to have like an Anderson Silva or an Israel Adesanya or a Robert Whittaker or a Yoel Romero or whatever mm-hmm. lying to us about what middleweight is. Instead, yeah. we have the true face of it. An athlete who is supremely not good at stuff and a the most guy middleweight champion <laughs> yeah. since yeah. Uh, like Rich Franklin. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and both of them, yeah, th- this is like the most both sides representative matchup uh, that the middleweight title has ever had Mm -hmm. Uh, representative of the division and, and, and truly two uniquely awkward stylists fighting for the title. Mm -hmm. One uh, idiosyncratic idiosyncratic is the word Uh, Sean Strickland, a guy who's, uh, mechanics and everything are slightly weird, but work because of uh, because of uh, guile and hard earned experience. Drinkus Duplessis, a guy whose entire system of techniques is if system is even the word, is complete nonsense. He's horribly schooled, but whose style works because of insane athleticism. Also, both benefiting from an unusual poise. Um, an uncanny sort of calm that belies how stupid their fighting styles can look. Um, I, I'm, I'm really, really ready for this one. Um, I don't know. I've watched an awful lot of Drinkus Duplessis, uh, this week, Phil. I've watched fights numerous times and I still, all, all I can do is sort of scratch the surface of why he's such a weird fighter. You know, uh, there's just no, it just doesn't, it, there's no way to catalog a lot of what makes Drikus work. But that is the thing, like, his style just keeps working, despite the fact that every time you look at him fighting, it does not seem remotely practical. No. Uh, yeah, the man is just, he's just like a walking car crash. Yeah. Like, every part of him is just fighting every other part of him the whole time or as i believe they would uh they would call it in south africa an auto smash (laughs) i believe instead of train wreck they say train smash you're a total train smash (laughs) wow you really have researched this like (laughs) deeply (laughs) (laughs) i looked up some clips of south african tv shows to get a handle on the it's absolutely insane, not quite New Zealand way that they talk. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I watched. I, I watched some of this. I watched some of uh, his fights against uh, Brad Tavares, and there was a part where he tried to faint against Brad Tavares <laughs> and had to stop himself from falling over, like <laughs> the sheer like weight of his shoulders being yeah. like jerked forward suddenly seemed like it was going to like carry him onto his face yeah the moment you say that you watch the fighter try to faint i mean that really does more than anything that captures the essential awkwardness of uh of... i mean it because it, it, yeah because it's <laughs> the it's the idea that like the intent of it was obviously that he would uh make Brad Tavares think that, like, an attack was coming. But what actually happened was that, obviously, very, you know, microseconds into doing this, all of his attention had to be simply focused on stopping yeah. himself. He's so tense and, like, top-heavy and and everything, even the feints are done with, like, almost more power than his bulky frame can manage. Like, uh, we're, Which we're, makes we're... them oddly, which <laughs> makes it, as I think you said yes. before we started recording, like, Oddly effective. Yeah. Because, like, you don't know, like, his opponent doesn't know if he's, like, throwing a strike. Yeah. Or if he's just falling over. Or what? Like, because I don't think he does until, like, until the physics resolve themselves. Yeah, I mean, um, we are going to talk about the rest of UFC 297, by the way. Just want to let everyone know there's apparently another title fight on this card. Raquel Pennington, Myra Bueno Silva. Uh, one, so someone had to be, um, <laughs> one of the more sexist members of Abby Hagan's had to be reminded of that fact. <laughs> you know what? It's being classed as one of the more sexist members of a two-man show. I think I'll take it. <laughs> um, Arnold Allen, Mobstar of Love. We're going to talk about that. Maybe Chris Curtis, Mark andre Barrio. It's a weird pay-per-view, but let's just continue because it, it's too fascinating, the main event. I have talked before... Um, about, like with Cyril Gaon, I remember, when he fought Junior Dos Santos, I I remember that um, being an occasion when I talked about how sort of slowing a technique down can be effective. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, particularly um, pertaining to his kicks, that he would show Junior Dos Santos the low kick and the body kick, and then he would fire a head kick, and he would fire it and sort of sell the misdirection by loading it up quite slowly. And this is a thing. This is a feel thing that, that really uh, natural fighters can sort of manipulate. Drinkus Duplessis does not strike one as a natural fighter in that sense. There is no grace to this man. There is no actual, like, subtlety. But the effect is kind of similar. That... Mm -hmm. Everything Drakus does is sort of equally telegraphed. Yep. Everything tends There's to just come just a kind of avalanche of flesh coming at his opponent, <laughs> yes. and something is going to come flying out of it, like heaving with it's heaving for <laughs> breath. Like <laughs> some kind of punch will come flying out of this yeah. thing that is coming at you. Or a kick. It could be a punch to the head or the body. It could be a really awkward but very powerful takedown attempt. Like um, everything is done with such tension and fully loaded power that at a certain point in most Drikas fights, the opponent just can't really tell what he's doing. Uh, and I think a prime example of that is the knockdown of Robert Whitaker. Uh, this is a fight that starts with Whitaker just like the first three minutes. Whitaker is just schooling Drakus, mm. absolutely taking him apart. And there is one particularly funny sequence where, yeah, Drakus, like, he eats like a low kick, and you can see like the wheels turning, the square wheels turning in his head. Uh, and he's like, I'm going to charge forward and throw a body kick. I'm pretty sure that's what he's intending because he's landed that technique a couple times. So he just sort of bursts at Robert Whitaker, totally square, weird little stutter step going on. Looks like he's trying to load up a kick. And Whitaker just sticks a jab out and Drigas just runs face first into it because the expected reaction was not granted from Robert Whitaker. But then as the fight goes on, 
Whitaker just can't like keep up with. First of all, like like Drigas is a very brave fighter. You know, he he uh-huh. is virtually impossible to discourage, which is a really useful quality, given the fact that a lot of his fights start pretty terribly for him, where he is just like running into the opponent's jabs, etc. And and when they don't start terribly, they tend to go terribly for like most of a round after that when he's tired. But at a certain point, Drakus just keeps coming, and he's putting his strikes together more. He's countering more. He's always trying to give it back, even when he gets hit completely clean. And Whitaker just can't keep up with, like, what is this very obvious tell actually indicating to me? And he gets dropped with Uh a jab, which both speaks to the incredibly – it's not the way a jab should be thrown. It's a super awkward shot to time. Also speaks to the massive power that Drakus obviously carries, and that being another essential element to the incredible success he's been having, that he is just super strong and hits super hard. Yep. But he's so awkward. Like, it, 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 it both it gets punished hilariously every single fight. It also works to his favor. It shouldn't. But he's got the right mental and physical qualities to make it sort of an advantage, except when it's not, and he's getting punished for it. He's just so difficult to explain from an analytical uh-huh. point of view. Yeah. I mean, yeah, part of me, a lot, a big part of me, maybe the biggest part, uh-huh. just thinks that, like, uh, Drikas is like, a, he's just an, a living example of tail risks. He's just, uh, we're just talking Paddy Pimblet with the dials turned up and in a worse division. In that he's strung together a fortunate list of wins over people who are mostly old. Yeah. And then has managed to pick up one, like, one win in the way which we've always sort of talked about is a is a vulnerability for um you know your Whitakers and your Kyojis and so on of the world, which is that they when they want to close distance on an opponent, they yeah. suddenly burst after them and you can just meet them halfway and they die instantly. Yeah. Um because it's that is the that's the whole karate thing, is that you you know, you you uh double the impact and so on. And yeah, when it's used against those kind of fighters, it is yeah, it is pretty lethal. And that, and to me, that is sort of the uh, the way that fight played out. I, I didn't really think because was doing that well. <laughs> um, he was also just brutalizing Bobby on the ground and having mm-hmm. bizarre success there, as he does against everybody. I mean, that is one of the overall strongest parts of Drigas's game is his ground and pound. Perhaps because, like, I just don't think his power works the way other people's power does. It mm-hmm. doesn't work like Robert Whitaker's power, for example, which is like, comes down to landing strikes at the perfect distance with perfect timing and very quickly. Um, yeah. And catching the opponent, like, off rhythm. Drigas's power works even when he's completely just arm punching from, like, an awkward position on the ground. It's it's like sheer muscle power. Um, yeah, yeah, and that I think, I think that ground game is that's the main thing that really has me asking questions in this fight. Yeah, me too. I mean, I again, and I guess he technically did beat Robert Whisker on the feet. I, again, I just I just cannot see him with any <laughs> reliability beating Sean Strickland on the feet. Yeah, it just seems As, like if he were to spend five rounds with Strickland on the feet, um, you know, it just seems like you watch that second round with Darren Till and the number of jabs and straight lefts he eats and just like f- falling into the fence and like every time he tries to like disengage, just completely squaring himself up. And even like even his footwork is telegraphed like mm-hmm. That if you can keep this dude on the end, if you have a reach advantage and you can keep him on the end of straight shots, you're going to land a lot. But uh, yeah, the I mean, the other thing is that I feel he's a little like 
Jessica Andrade, and they're like he's not actually very good in the clinch. He's just he's just super strong. I mean, like you said, he's he, he loses his feet so consistently that like he's he's often just like sorting them out in yeah. uh clinch breaks and like uh, the other person just gets to move past him and uh, just just clock him from the side. Yeah. But there is also a um, weird thing with Drikus. If he can connect his hands or get any kind of strong grip and a tie up, you just see his power come to bear. I mean, he uh, Phil mm-hmm. He had an arm throwed Robert Whitaker successfully. Yeah. You know, like Yeah, like I said, it, it was like a <laughs> for me it was like an Andrade it was like it's like an Andrade thing rather than a Yeah. Like I don't think he is good in the clinch. I think he is very, very strong compared yeah. to pretty much everyone that he fights. Yeah, he's very, very strong, which allows him to be quite a good scrambler as well, even though like yeah, I think I think that is the area in which he is actually genuinely like he might ha- actually have some ability. Yeah, he's still awkward there though. Like, mm-hmm. God, speaking of the Darren Till fight, there's a part where he's on top of Darren, he's on a body triangle on his back, and then he disconnects his his foot from his knee. He tries to switch to mount, and and like his angle's just all wrong, and Darren just sits up, and Drakus falls off. Uh, like he's he's still awkward and cumbersome, but he's it is the power I think that makes him such a good scrambler. He can just apparently like cheat his way out of certain positions uh-huh. and just blast back to his feet or into top position when he wants to. Um, it is the wrestling and the grappling. I agree that I think makes this fight particularly. Interesting, at least as a, it makes it more of a pick 'em because Sean Strickland has quite good takedown defense statistically. Mm-hmm. It has not really been tested very much here in the middleweight division, or like at all. Oh, well, I mean Jack Hermanson, I guess. Yeah, Jack Hermanson, who is not—I mean, notably like—is like the antithesis of Drakus in terms of physical prowess. Like when Jack Hermanson fights a big strong guy, you can tell he's not a yeah, big he strong guy. Off. Yeah. Um, Drakus has more of the kind of raw strength that like Jared Cannonier has, which which probably yes. makes a difference. And Jack does get. Um, they probably didn't credit it as a completed takedown, but he does sort of get the first takedown he tries on Sean Strickland. He smashes into him in open space, drives him back to the cage spins around to a rear waist cinch and throws Strickland down to his hands and knees. And Strickland pops up and he does a lot better than say Darren Hill against Drikus and that he actually fights the hands when he gets back up and escapes. He's certainly a better technical clinch fighter, but there are opportunities to catch the, you know, similarly awkward square Sean Strickland out of position and just horse him off his feet with raw power. Um, and yeah, we just haven't really seen that matchup for Sean. I mean, the closest is not even a reasonable comparison. It was when he got taken down three times by Kamara Usman, who is, yes, big and freakishly strong, but also like actually a good wrestler. Yes. Whereas most of Drakus's, aside from the head and arm throw against Whitaker, most of his wrestling highlights are really like low lights. <laughs> They're him lat dropping himself onto his own ass or getting buzzed and going for a reactive shot on Derek Brunson where he just gets fucking pancaked. <laughs> it just <laughs> doesn't work. Like he, he technically is not close to a guy like Kamaru, but he is strong. Boy, is he strong. Yeah. I mean, I guess the main thing is, uh, yeah. So the, what's the other, the other, um, Example of uh, Strickland beating a an actual like coherent wrestling threat, or at least takedown wrestling threat, is Brendan Allen. But does Brendan Allen actually even try any takedowns? I can't remember. I think he might have tried a couple, but he's even Brendan Allen is not really a great wrestler. No, a lot of his uh, wrestling certainly... and 
grappling success at middleweight has to do with his willingness to go to the ground with anybody, but Mm -hmm. Uh, so he kind of breaks styles, which don't really depend on a tremendous wrestling threat as much as like, you better hope you don't get taken down. He himself is not a tremendous takedown artist. None of these guys are, you know, like Nasruddin Imovov, Abu Smagomedov, Jack Hermanson, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think Jared tried any takedowns against Strickland. None that I recall. He just gets yeah. a lot of striking matches. and that, But and... I think, but you know, in sort of go-everywhere fighters, I mean, Hermanson did try a bunch, and, he did. you know, Alan will take what's given. And I think, you know, Strickland is just generally a well... He's a well-schooled takedown defender. Yeah. And I guess the main, the main thing is just, like... The main thing is a is a mental... Uh, is, is a mental one for me. Yeah. Because one of the things about, like, watching the Tavares fight... Is that is that Drikas scares Tavares? Yes. In a way that like Tavares has never really recovered from. I feel, well, not quite. But, like he scared Tavares out of being Brad Tavares and of being being boring and like just picking picking off his opponent. He draws Tavares into just swinging with him. Yeah. And they have this incredibly stupid brawl. I found myself thinking like. Is it possible that Drikas Duplessis can freak Sean Strickland out? Yeah. And I'd... In in that kind of way. And I just find myself thinking, the answer is just no. Doesn't seem like... I just like... don't think. Yeah. I mean, it could be. It could be. You know, I wouldn't, wouldn't have thought you could really... I mean, he... I think he scares everyone. Brad he, I, I think he scares everyone he fights, to be honest. Just because his his game just doesn't make doesn't work, and by the time you realize that it is working, I think it's a horrifying realization for a lot of people. I mean, Derek Brunson was beating him easily until he wasn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brad well, Tavares. I don't think anyone was... is. I don't think anyone is as stubborn. Yes. In their approach, in in their like belief that they have found the best kind of fighting in the world. Yeah, as Sean Strickland is. I agree. Like, I just don't see him, like, I don't think it's possible to, like, scare him into changing gears. Alex Pereira could not really scare him into changing gears. No, no, much like... he just died rather than change. (laughs) Yeah, he's got a sort of Mac from It's Always Sunny mentality. Mm -hmm. I'm dug in, and I'll never change. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. And so that's the thing, like, and 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 a lot of that is what sort of uh, you know tips the balance of many of Drikas's fights. Is I think people freaking out, whether it's Derek Brunson or Brad Tavares yeah. or whatever, even to some extent Robert Whittaker maybe. But it's just that people get drawn into his kind of pace because he is obviously always completely knackered, and no matter what his team says about like you know, it's ninety percent. You know, he, he was working at 10% oxygen efficiency now. And now we're going to see what he's like when he's, you know, you're going to feel the air getting thinner yeah. in uh, the arena as the mighty bellows of Drikas's lungs <laughs> stuck in every <laughs> fragment of oxygen from around him. Uh, but, you know, whatever the, whatever they are saying, <laughs> Drikas is 100% going to get tired and... Yeah, uh, even sloppier, and yeah, I just, I just cannot see that being a functional, uh, like way of keeping an advantage against Sean Strickland. Like, and similarly, you know, the takedowns—they have like a fifty percent chance of being some, you know, wildly uh, impractical takedown that actually works. And a 50% chance of being the most humiliating pratfall you've seen <laughs> since the last Rikas Duplessis fight. Like, is this going to work over five rounds? But he'll keep going for it. And even after he gets tired, he will, mm-hmm. like, Drikas is one of the few guys I can think of who will, his recovery time will consist of him just soaking up damage. Yeah. Like in the Till fight, he's like, 
absolutely blowing wind in round two and just getting drilled and like running along. His body language is terrible, but he is using that time that he's being pieced up to regain his energy. He just doesn't yeah. get discouraged, you know, like it's, it's crazy. And yeah. And one thing I will oh. say is that even though the, the dynamic on the feet really does look terrible for a guy like Drikas, and no, I don't think he can, um, I, I agree. I think Sean Strickland is too stubborn to get like shaken out of his pretty rock solid fighting style. There is an opportunity for Drakus' power to come to bear because, mm -hmm. you know, a Alex I'm Pereira sad. got him with guile, but he got him because, as we've said many times, Strickland's style is, there is like a, there's a, um, a pinch point. There's like a breaking point in his game where if you can throw off, he's so dependent on reacting to things correctly. Because he's really yeah. tall and he stands really square and he doesn't even really keep his hands up. Um, he needs to see the shots coming and time them accurately. And he does this remarkably well. But Alex Pereira was tricky and threw his timing off and, and exploited the fact that Strickland is there to be hit and his hands are going to come out anytime uh, he, he is trying to defend something. Drakus could very likely achieve the same kind of result just in a stupider way by just being really devilishly difficult to time and predict. And Drakus yeah. does, he is willing to go to the legs, to go to the body. He puts his shots together not well, but confidently that it almost passes for like a smoothness of, of combination attack. So I don't want to think I, I don't want to say that we saw Alex Pereira just dead Sean Strickland with one shot. Drakus has a similar kind of power and he's just awkward enough that the idea of spending 25 minutes on the feet with him, supposing Strickland can beat his wrestling game is still not like safe. You're going to be in there de for demanding of yourself to perfectly time a really, really awkward dude. Yeah. As it, all it takes is for the wrong yeah. boulder to come bouncing out of the flesh avalanche. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, I think the other thing I find interesting about this one, which I think will probably dictate a reasonable amount of what we see in, in, in the later rounds, uh -huh. is... The the Derek Lewis cardio equation, mm -hmm. which is that people get tired uh, tying up with Drakus yep. because he's very strong. Like just a simple simple thing like that is that he, he equalizes the cardio equation because like yeah. they just get really tired like hanging around with him and trying to trying to keep up with him. And this and uh, for forever for all that you know Strickland has had his incredible success middleweight he is not he is not a great athlete no and the time when this surprised me most the uh, narrative in which uh which i think i got wrong in his career was the cannoneer fight because mm. the one thing i was sh almost sure about that fight was that the dynamic would be one of Broadly, you know, it would be very close and so on. It was very hard to call, and that was true. But that broadly, it would be a fight where Cannoneer was probably going to start losing. Sorry, start, Cannoneer was going to start winning and then would be losing towards the end. And then vice versa. Like, Strickland would be picking up later rounds as he adapted to Cannoneer more. But, like, a big part of it was that towards the closing rounds of that fight, Strickland was just physically getting pushed out of it. Yeah. Like the rounds are all very close and competitive in that fight, but the the actual narrative of it was the exact opposite of the one that I thought. Like you can the rounds Strickland is more likely to pick up are the early ones. Yep. The rounds Cannoneer is picking up are the late ones. And he's just he's just pushing Strickland out of it. So I think that what we are likely to so my my main feeling is that what we're likely to get is that Strickland can 
avoid that kind of thing that you're talking about with um uh against like Darren Till because he has the advantage of being someone with just a metronomic pace. Yes. Someone who's just it's just there and it's just there forever and it doesn't go up and it doesn't go down and that's a very useful thing to have in many cases. It just it just sits there at the same and you can't really find time to recover against it. It's just there. It keeps going. But on the other hand, he's I think he's going to get knackered. I think the this probably will go to the fifth round. I think by that time, it's going to be insanely ugly. I think yeah. Strickland is going to be exhausted. And I think Drikas will also be absolutely shattered. Drikas and... will have been exhausted since the sixth minute of the fight. Like, Yeah, oh, this is, yeah, this is actually very true. But he's going to be, like, even worse by this point. He's yeah, going yeah. to be just, like... Rivers of sweat hitting the ground, just, yeah, heaving for air. And I think Strickland's also going to be very tired, but still kind of jabbing Drikas up a bunch. And he'll probably lose at least, by that point, he'll probably, like, get... I guess he'll just get, like, ankle-picked or something, just for a, a Drikas, uh, like, Pyrrhic victory. He'll get hit by the stupidest ankle pick you've ever seen. Yeah. In that fifth round. Like a Romero style, like just reaching down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lifting, like a one-handed thing. Of <laughs> lifting way, his foot like, off the ground. Yeah. But also, like, as Drikas does it, the leverage of him doing that slams his own face into the floor. <laughs> he will smash his face into the ground, ducking down for the foot. And then the, yeah. the, the power of him wrenching it off the floor, he will himself do a backflip. At the same yeah. time, as Sean Strickland, the back of Sean Strickland's head bounces off the ground. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> and he might like drop Strickland in that round, you know, like he uh-huh. is like Cannoneer actually. I mean, I think this, the more I think about it, this is a pretty strong comparison, but he just doesn't have Cannoneer's, um, Gale? doesn't have his what? Skill. Yeah. But also doesn't have his like patience, which sometimes works against Jared. Uh-huh. Like, if he gets the kind of momentum that Cannoneer had at the end of that fight, no matter how tired he is, I you just get the feeling that Drikas will just keep pressing it and will keep throwing out weirder and uglier combinations. I, I don't think it's impossible that he just drills Strickland late in this fight. Yeah. It just happens. Like, he's, a, he's got great finishing instincts. Absolutely. And it just happens. Like, people just can't cope with the awkwardness of Drikas' striking for for long you know you you think you can and you're tagging him so easily and then like something just even like a normal strike like a jab just comes in such an awkward way and with so much power that it just like crushes you yeah it is it is genuinely like notable how few people have had Physical, really? How, how how many people are like big, strong middleweights that have had physical fights with Sean Strickland? Yeah, even the even the Cannoneer fight is, um, a lot of it is Cannoneer, you know, leveraging his striking. Uh, you know, he doesn't he doesn't just try and hulk Strickland around. Yeah, which might have benefited him, but he's pretty much just yeah. having a Sean Strickland fight. And to his credit, and this is a cautionary note about Strickland he does win it but yeah you just get the feeling that if Cannoneer had just gone Hulk mode in round five like would it not have probably gotten him some big moments yeah so I don't know I I find this quite difficult to call just because I find Drikas Duplessis quite difficult to grasp yeah, I mean he he does he does suck really bad. He does, but also, but also he doesn't. <laughs> yeah, He's... so like yeah, everyone, everyone that Strickland has fought has basically either come into the category, or at, especially at middleweight, has either come come into the category of like frail or technical, yes, or or like both. And with the obvious exceptions being, with the obvious single obvious exception being like Alex Pereira. Yeah. And Drakus Duplessis is neither frail nor technical. <laughs> he is, mm-hmm. he is Drakus. Um, 
I don't know. He, I mean, the I've thing- got to pick Sean Strickland. I just, I, I, I'm sorry. I cannot. I, <laughs> I, I cannot believe that Dreyfus Duplessis is good. Like he's I'm, not. I'm still. Yeah, I know, but I like. I can't believe that it's not just flukes that he's winning fights. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm I don't just, know, I'm man. Just like, I just don't think he can beat good people. I think it's just a, it's just a weird fluke. Uh, I'm not like I cannot make myself buy it. But Sean um, did just lose and Sean, it. Uh, Sean Strickland again, like, is not that good either. That's the thing. But, this is just like a. But it's just the middleweight t- he's gonna, title. He's just going to punch Drieker so many times. He's going to punch him so many times. He's going to punch him like more than Whitaker did. He's not like, going to a lot more. He's not going to like. Gonna, he's nev- and he's never going to lunge across distance at him at, ever. No. He's just going to be there. He's just going to like stand there at a range at which like Drieker is always stumbling around. Yeah, he's also probably not going to like drop Drakus or, and this is another thing is that like, I, I would have much a better feeling about this for Strickland if he was like a big body puncher. Mm-hmm. I mean, he'll, he'll, he'll instead flick up. Instead of the most head hunting man in the history of the world. Yeah, he must have like 85 plus percent of his strikes are targeted at the head. He'll throw some good body kicks now and yeah, then. Yeah, he'll, he'll, he's got a good, um, like teeth and front kick and so on. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, That's a big part of the Adesanya win. But just something to um, like sort of equalize and make Drikus's bad cardio more a problem than it really usually turns out to be. Uh, try I just, to... Uh, that's the thing. I just think the the like the monotonous pace is, could be. It's just is just going to be enough. And like uh, Drikus's main way of disrupting that is the stupidest takedowns ever. Yeah. And like, do I can I expect those to work? Like, sure, like one or two of them will. Is that? I mean, like, maybe maybe each each stupid make each incredibly dumb takedown that he gets is just an entire round of top control because Strickland is a former welterweight. Yeah, who can't get out from underneath him. Yeah, maybe that's it. But I don't know, man. I just, I just can't see it. I just. I mean, I can see it. I could just see him, you know, as, <laughs> as you, you always do, like just, just, you know, blundering around and then, <laughs> like, charging past Strickland and like clipping him with a clothesline. Yeah, yeah. You can't and see Strickland it. Strickland goes cartwheeling through the air. You can't but see like, it, but you have seen it, Phil. You have seen yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> it keeps happening. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'll. I'll, he's, I'll... he's too bad. Like I. That's, I I can't pick him. I, can't. I will ride with you and take Sean Strickland, but I am really not confident. Um, I just mm-hmm. think there is a certain je ne sais quoi to uh, Drakus's game that just. I, I, well, I mean, so it's like you said, the, the man is genuinely unprecedented. We've never yeah. seen someone this obviously bad do this well. Yeah, he may in fact turn out to be a great fighter while still not being even remotely good. Mm-hmm. Um, he is just a a really, I mean, the most idiosyncratic middleweight, and that is saying something. Uh, there is. So I'll, I'll take Strickland to defend, but uh, hey, I picked Bobby Knuckles over this man, and look how that turned out. Like, just you know, of course you picked Bobby. Knuckles of course over I did. This man. Exactly. That's what but, any Zane person would do. But then why would I pick Sean Strickland? He's not as good as Bobby Knuckles. He's a it just doesn't, doesn't make sense, Phil. It just doesn't make sense. All right. Well, we're picking That's Sean we Strickland ill advisedly, uh, I'm sure. But uh, that'll be it. I mean, we've, uh, we've. I mean, if I mean to be fair, if uh, if Drikus wins, at least we get. Uh, I mean, hopefully, we get uh, Drikus Cannonier. Um. Yeah, or Drikus Adesanya Sean. would be really funny. Uh, no, I want, I want Drinkers kind of there. I don't need to see, is he? Having, I would very much like, I, I would, would love l- to see that. It would be, it would be two very different types of very physical insanity matched up against each other. True. True. Um, so that's it. <laughs> We've spent the, really what should be the bulk of the runtime of this episode, just trying to understand 
this fight and both of these fighters, but really one of them, Dracus Duplessis. Um, this is all also supposing the fight even comes about, Phil, because Sean Strickland has just recently promised to stab Dracus Duplessis if he crosses the line with his trash talk at the press conference. Um, Ooh. <laughs> So. John, yes, Sean Strickland and his, uh, <laughs> hey guys, I'm just going to say whatever because words aren't real kind of thing. And then someone says something mean to him and he's like, I'm going to kiss you. I'm going to fucking stab you. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, yeah, but we're very much looking forward to it. It's an absolute shit show in a way that only MMA and, and only middleweight MMA really can provide. Um. The, the League of Extraordinary Journeymen continues. I wouldn't describe either of these guys. Well, one of them is extraordinary, truly. Yeah, he uh, might be the most extraordinary journeyman of all time. He really might be. Um, boy, I wish I hadn't picked Sean Strickland, but I'm sticking with it now. I'm sticking with it. Okay, let's take a break. When we come back, the women's bantamweight title still exists and is being contended by Raquel Pennington and Myra Bueno Silva. Uh, further down in this card, we have Arnold Allen versus Mavsar Evloev in a really quite good featherweight uh, prospect slash contenders matchup. And uh, we're going to talk about those when we return. After this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. We are talking now about the co-main event of UFC 297. That is Raquel Pennington versus Myra Bueno Silva for the vacant women's bantamweight title. The fans have been asking for it, Phil. And the UFC delivers. Yeah. Uh, it's it's really hard to go online without just getting... And in some ways, it's, it, it gets a bit, like, wearying when you go online, and you just constantly have to yeah. just plow through just legions of people just trumpeting their support yeah. for either Anna Silva or Raquel Pennington. Yeah. Just like... These things come in waves. There were the, the, tough, mm-hmm. the, the tough noobs... There were the, the, the McGregor noobs, and now we've got the Bueno Silva bros and the, mm-hmm. the Penning turds. You know, they're just clogging <laughs> up, clogging up every single channel of MMA communication. It's like, God, these aren't even real MMA fans. They're just, mm-hmm. you, they're just there for the next big yeah. thing. You get these electric next. personalities, these obnoxiously just out there fighters and, wouldn't you know it? All these goddamn casuals just come running. I mean, this really is the mask off event, right? Uh, because <laughs> you know, for for middleweight, it, we get finally a true middleweight like title fight where no one can pretend. Yep. How unmiddleweight these fighters are. Yep. And like, this is the most women's bantamweight title fight I have literally ever <laughs> seen in my life. No more Ronda. No more Amanda Nunes. They tried. This is what Boy, you got now. Did they try to get Holly Holm in there one last time? And let me tell you, Phil, if they could have done Holly Holm, Raquel Pennington 3 for the title, they would have. People would have cheered their asses <laughs> off after she'd just spent 10 minutes running Raquel into the fence they, again. They would have inexplicably loved it. But no, Myra Buena Silva submitted Holly Holm. And then pops. surely, surely they just got, they're just they should just be like uh, telling Valentina to just go back up to bantamweight, right? So they can at least have one, yeah, <laughs> one but... fairly well known fighter in this weight class. Nope, this is what we got. Um, what happened to Juliana Pena, by the way? Where is she? Surely she picked up some. No, some... being being insane somewhere, I guess. Yeah, but she must have picked up some cred and some heat with that. Uh... Nunez yeah, when yeah. like where... she's she's also been always been historically like quite injury prone. Uh 
Yeah, I would imagine is probably and she's, what's you know, happened to her. She's got a she's got a life outside of fighting. She got other stuff going on. She's got a kid. Mm-hmm. She's she's got a uh, a fiance or something. I think. Yeah. Um. Anyway, we, let's talk about it. <laughs> eh, yeah, let's do it. Um. Okay, Myra Bona Silva, kind of. Yeah. A, a very shooter box fighter. Yes. Um, just kind of comes forward, uh, like uh, kind of pressure counter punches. Looks mm-hmm. for the opponent to like respond to her pressure, and then immediately like, and then immediately responds to that. Like very durable, very confident, all that other kind of stuff. Pretty good on the ground. Mm-hmm. Pretty powerful. Uh, like this was really weird watching her fight Holly Holm because, uh. You would have thought that like Holly Holm would have really enjoyed fighting someone who just comes forward, but someone who comes forward at a steady pace, yeah, and never throws, clearly just absolutely destroyed what remained of Holly Holm's uh, inclination towards a counterpuncher game and turned her yeah uh, straight back into uh, a wall and stall. Yeah, uh, Holly doesn't really have like a Holly. great jab or anything to like draw those shots out of people so she uh she she was frazzled by this sort of steady un- non-committal pressure of Myra Bueno Silva mm-hmm. um and you know that's a that's a credit to uh to Bueno Silva I mean she's got a pretty functional game overall mm-hmm. like I said she's uh she's she's pretty powerful she's got decent timing she does tend to put her counters together in like two punch combinations um relatively strong in the clinch which she will often end up in uh as her opponent dashes off the fence uh, in response to her pressure it's a pretty um nuts and bolts kind of typical mma game i would say Mm-hmm. Um, which is really what you want to say about a fighter inside of fight. <laughs> Nuts and bolts, typical, uh, lunch pail, you know, pick your, uh, pick your blue collar epithets from the, uh, from the barrel there. Um, but hey, at least we've got a strong contrast with, uh, Raquel Pennington. Yes. Uh, you would <laughs> never describe Raquel Pennington as lunch pail or... <laughs> Uh, but you know what? We we both like Raquel Pennington. We do, yeah. Uh, she is like a... She is someone who has genuinely improved from being a lunchbox uh, kind of... Lunchbox? Lunch pale fighter. Uh-huh. Um, into being a like thoughtful and reasonably like technically coherent lunch pail fighter. Yeah, <laughs> there's, a, there's a, croak, a croak madame in that lunch pail. Oh, yeah. You know, this, um, this is no PB and J. Yeah, I mean, she's genuinely, uh, uh, she's mostly kept back by some fairly significant physical limitations. Yes. But there is a genuine argument that, like, she is the best. She was the best striker in the bantamweight division, even like from a technical standpoint. Like, even before Amanda Nunez, like, and Amanda Nunez, I apologize, uh, like left. Like, she is, you know, short and short armed. And the ability to, like, throw, slip, and throw again, and all this other kind of stuff that Nunes would never bother with because she never had to because she was much bigger than everyone else and yeah, and, she's, and everything else. Uh, she's very plodding you know, compared to a fighter like Nunes. Like, I, I think, actually, in her recent fights, we have seen um, Pennington uh, gain confidence, and we've seen a lot of hand speed out of her, actually. Um, mm mm-hmm. She, but the foot speed is not and has never been there. No. Uh, and yeah, she's just not a large phantom weight. Yeah. Um, like, not just just not physically imposing, pretty much anywhere. No. Nope. That's uh, quite reasonably physically strong, but you know, that's that's about it. She's sturdy. Yeah. Um. So. And, yeah, I, I think the main thing is that she's definitely on the wrong side of the physical equation for this one. Uh, and there's, like, a really strong chance that she just gets, like, pushed out of the fight uh, because uh, Buena Silva is just yeah not that much younger than her. Like, Buena Silva doesn't have many fights, but she is, like, 32. 
but she uh, is younger in fight years and is just like a, a, gen- a generally like superior athlete. I think the main the main problem is that like there's a solid chance that we get like a Drekus potential Drekus Strickland kind of thing where they they trade shots and it just becomes immediately apparent that Pennington is uh, physically outclassed, which was basically what happened to her against Nunes. Is that yeah? You realize that like yeah, maybe there's a world in which like Pennington could gas Nunes out or you know draw her into technical exchanges and so on, but she can't do that because she's getting absolutely nuked from range by someone who's bigger, faster, and and more powerful. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, to be... There's nothing like that kind of gulf here. Like, Marabuena Silva is not a massive bantamweight, but it's still one which concerns me. Yeah, she's, um, she's not a massive uh, fighter like Nunes was, not to that degree. Um, I'll actually look at the numbers. I suspect she is bigger than, than Pennington on paper. Wikipedia says 5'7 with a 66 and a half inch wingspan. Uh, no, actually. Reach wise, less than Raquel Pennington, if you would believe that. That's on paper. Oh. We'll see how they actually look in the cage. Yeah. Um, but, there is still clearly an obvious athletic advantage for Bueno Silva, which is usually just the barrier to to Pennington's success. I mean, you you stick her in there against, um, you know, Aspen Ladd and Panny Kianzad and Marion Renault, and she's she just has a very clear technical edge. And all, mm-hmm. all the confidence in the world to just workmanlike, just plug away and and leverage that. She's, as you said, she's just a solid boxer. Got a good jab, puts combinations together well. Her counter game, in particular, I think has seen a serious upgrade uh, in her most recent fights. I think, in particular, her fight with Aspen Ladd, the counter right hand was like quicker and better timed than I think I've ever seen it. I'm sure, mm-hmm. it, sure it helped that she actually had like a really meaningful reach advantage there. But yeah, then you put her in there against somebody like Ketlin Vieira, who I would say is like just a much clumsier, sort of worse version of the uh, attributes that Bueno Silva has, if probably a little bigger, but a much less well-schooled fighter. And Pennington like barely scraped out a win against her. Just because uh-huh. when Vieta like grabbed her in the clinch, she just like wasn't strong enough to just break free immediately. Um, that's just the wall for Raquel Pennington, whether it's Vieira, with whom she scraped by, or Holly Holm, or Jermaine Durandamy, or Amanda Nunes, whom she pretty clearly lost to. All three. Oh it yeah, is- she got horrifically smoked by Nunes. Nunes, Nunes yeah. certainly. Um, I think the home fight was probably the closest, but even Holly Holm is just like too strong and too annoying and like moves too much uh, for Pennington to I mean, just... We, we've both seen that one and we kind of agree that yeah. Holm probably loses it, but it's so dreadful. It's yeah. so bad. And Holm spends so much time squishing her into the fence. And Pennington just cannot put a stamp on a fight against those superior mm-hmm. physical fighters. So I I think I just kind of lean towards Bueno Silva bullying her too much. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think I'm I'm going to I'm going to go for the aspirational pick. I think I will go for Pennington cuz I like Pennington. Yeah. And it's still it's also like that uh like the big thing about the Vieira fight is Pennington just continuing to work off the jab. It's not that she's like jabbing her up, it's that he jabs her, and then Vieira tries to counter, and then Pennington counters the counter, and so on. Is that she's and but and Pennington is like willing to double and triple up on the jab to yep. just keep a uh, like just keep uh, Vieira unsure of when to throw back. It's kind of a sort of uglier version of like what John McDessy would do to people who are much bigger. Yeah, than him. but it and, certainly means she has much much better tools to deal with the patient non-committal pressure game than Holly Holm did. Mm-hmm. Hundred percent. And yeah, that's the uh, that's the other thing about um, the other thing about Bueno Silva is that like I feel like her counter punching game is that 
She's waiting for you to do something, and then she will swing. And that's fine against Holly Holm, because Holly Holm has, only really has like a few things that she does, which is like throwing for stuff which misses from far away, <laughs> uh, charging you, or doing nothing. And mischarging and you like, and missing from far away. Yeah. And like none of these are particularly effective against someone who just walks forward and waits for you to throw something. Yeah. But, like... I think it was against uh, Manon Fioro, is that you saw how much Bueno Silva could struggle with just someone who just jabbed her and then did something else afterwards. Yeah, quickly. <laughs> like Fioro would like like jab her and then drop down for a takedown, or she would just like jab her and then like hit her again afterwards. Yep. And, like that is that is just what Pennington was doing against Vieira. She was jabbing her and then like immediately just jabbing her more or like looking to counter her counter. Yep. But and Fiero... I'm just not sure Buena Silva like deals with someone who can actually jab. I think you're totally right. It's just not something this is the joke of this division that she just hasn't really encountered that very often. A jab, that is. Mm-hmm. Um but, you know, I, I just don't think Pennington is Fioro. Like, Fioro is probably going to be contending for a title very soon. Uh, yeah, but she is a also a weight class down. Yeah, 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 yeah. What are you talking about, Raquel? Pennington's competing for a title, a really meaningful title. <laughs> That's true. Connor. That's true. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I see what you're saying. I, Fioro is much yeah, quicker. Yeah. No, She's I mean, I, I think, as feet. I said, I think... It's one of the ones where I think you are making the smart pick. Uh, it's just a pretty simple physical uh, barometer for me. Like, that's that's what I'm going on. Mara Buena Silva uh-huh. hits harder. I think she's physically stronger. I think she's faster. Um, yep. And, you know, that's just not a thing that, that, that Pennington beats, like, ever. She's just like every single one of her losses and even her, some of her direst wins, um, or closest ugliest fights where she just doesn't really see a way out of this like intractable sort of, we're going to stand in front of each other and hit each other and your hits are going to be harder, or we're going to clinch up and I'm going to go for like awkward collar ties and just not really be able to muscle you around. That's always defined by just a physical gap between her and the opponent. And I, I see that here. So that that's really the entire calculus behind this pick. Meyer Buena Silva, uh-huh. strong, pretty good athlete. Raquel Pennington, pretty strong, pretty bad athlete. Yep. As I said, I think it's the smart pick. Hey. Well, uh, I just want to uh, mention this now. I mean, why not? Uh, just to brighten our spirits before we close out and head into segment three. A couple people have tagged us in this. They've been very excited for us. But oh Phil, yeah! Are you aware that they have booked? Yes, Muhammad. I Usman. might not be aware of anything else, <laughs> but I'm aware of this. They've booked Muhammad Usman versus Chris, the artist formerly known as Huggy Bear Barnett. I am so excited! So... Like in the, in the same way that like Drinkus Duplessis against Sean Strickland might be the apotheosis of middleweight. Yeah. This might be the greatest heavyweight fight that anyone's ever booked. <laughs> so in any combat sport. Yep. The future is looking bright, my friends. It's looking very bright and very bouncy. <laughs> <laughs> but let's close out. Somehow this. inflatable. <laughs> it's somehow inflatable, but also very heavy. Um Yeah. Let's uh let's close this segment there. I'm picking Silva, you're picking Pennington. Everybody already forgot what fight we just talked about. Let's take a break. When we come back, Arnold Allen, Movsar Ivloev, and whatever else we have time for, which I believe will include me telling you what happened uh, last weekend, just to get your your sort of vital reaction to the news. Yep. Great. All right. All that after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. 
And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. Welcome back, one and all, to Heavy Hands. Let's talk about the main card opener here, Mavsar Ivloev, undefeated still in the UFC, um, has sort of, in fact, taken a, a somewhat similar path to that taken by his opponent on the way to genuine contention. That opponent is Arnold Allen. And uh, Allen just lost his last fight to Max Holloway. Wasn't really a bad look for him. Um, it's never a bad look, really, losing to Max Holloway. But even by that metric, Allen comported himself relatively well. And this is like his uh, bounce-back opportunity or his you know, fall out of the rankings opportunity. Mavsar of Love finally gets, uh, I think, a real step up and a chance to break through as a title contender here. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's a great fight. It's awesome. And um, I, Arnold Allen, you know, we, we had, a, we had a, a struggle, I think, sort of coming to grips with, like, how good he is and what makes him good. When he uh, he started getting tougher and tougher matchups, there is a sort of a quality that is difficult to put your finger on to Arnold Allen's greatness. Yeah. It comes down to just, I don't know, toughness, scrappiness, flexibility. Um, not really a thing I think a lot of MMA fighters are noted for, which is weird to say. This is MMA. The fight can go anywhere. But true stylistic flexibility, that is like a hallmark of Arnold Allen's that not a lot of fighters have. Um, Ivloev, a, quite a, a much simpler fighter to understand. And I was, you know, I was talking about this before, Phil. I was trying to, I was trying to kind of get a, get a picture of what I expected the matchup to look like. And one of the first things I mentioned, because it's obviously one of the first things that jumps out at me, is, um, you know, Mavsar Ivloev, he has a, a, a really effective jab. It's long, it's powerful, um, it kind of comes off the same like drop step that his shot entry comes off of. So he's got this sort of like GSP quality that lets him b- blend that into his wrestling game. And, you know, I was going mm-hmm. on, I was waps, waxing poetic about Mofsar of Love's interesting lead hand game. And then yep. you raised uh, a crucial point that I totally failed to consider, which is um, uh, what stance does Arnold Allen fight out of? Yeah. Anytime you're like, oh man, this guy's going to use his super good jab. You've, just got to be... You've always got to ask yourself, what stance does his opponent fight out of? Has he ever fought anyone who fights out of that stance before? Yeah. The point being that Arnold Allen is a southpaw um, and has really like a definitional southpaw game mm-hmm. um, in which he uses his own jab. Uh, but also knows all the sort of left-hand setups and tricks and switch-ups that uh, most people associate with lefties. And we looked at it, and Marv Sarov Love has just not fought southpaws. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this still doesn't entirely get into like what effect his wrestling game might have, what it looks like if... Um, if, like, uh, uh, what's his name? Danish guy or whatever who fought Allen back in the day. Mads, you, don't mean, you don't mean like Captain Finland, do you? Mads Burnell. Oh. He may not be Danish. Oh, yeah, no, Max. He Burnell, is yeah, Danish. Yeah, yeah. He is Danish. Yeah. Um, you know, Mads no. Burnell managed to get some quite a lot of success wrestling and using top yeah. position against Allen. Like, that's a whole other side of this matchup. But just sort of entries and range fighting, which Allen will force Ivloev to do a lot of. How effective is his game against a true blue southpaw? And it's hard to say. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to say. And in the... my and I think the answer should always be not very. Uh, when you're talking about MMA fighters in general, and to some extent, I'm going to say tri star fighters specifically. Mm. Um. Tend to be, actually no. Sorry, he's not a tri-star fighter. Alan Lannan is the tri-star fighter. Yes. Um. But 
Yeah, I think... Uh, so I think one of the things about... Um, this is why why I sort of went off on that slightly odd tangent there. One of the, one of the sort of comparisons I think of uh, with Evelo has been like Rory McDonald, the way he kind of mixes a mm-hmm. sort of stand up jab game with wrestling, uh, like step knees or this other kind of stuff. It's it, it's all like very reminiscent of Rory Rory Mac to me. Mm-hmm. And one of Rory Mac's main things was that he was like a really big welterweight. He wasn't athletic at all, but he was huge, especially for the time. Mm-hmm. Um. Which allowed him to like keep people on the end of his his range, um, and I think a big part of what made the Diego and I, th- I think a lot of that is that kind of relates to how uh, Evlov's game works as well. He's very you know his his ideal opponent is someone like a Dan Ige, who might be very good, but is also essentially a pretty stocky uh, featherweight. Yep, uh, like level changes. And is very much uh, like someone who all of those tools can be employed against. Um, Diego Lopez, on the other hand, is not a southpaw. He's huge. He's not a southpaw most of the time. He does yeah. he does switch some in that fight as long as it's on the feet. Yeah, but he's I mean he's just a messy he's a messy dude. But yes. mostly it's that he is uh, he, he's just really big. And uh, thus, like, Evlov doesn't doesn't have that kind of safety range to dictate with his jab. Yeah. He has to get into exchanges. And Arnold Allen is both big. He is bigger than Evlov. Uh, and, like, there's going to be a the gulf of an open stance engagement between the two of them. Yep. Um, so I think just, like... It's going to be very, very awkward for um, for Ivlo to set up his strikes on him, and yeah, I think the weirdness of Alan, I think, is is pretty much because he is someone who has been trained quite well mm-hmm. with a style which is almost uh, antith- antithetical to who he is as a person, which I think in in many ways is like a genuinely good thing for a lot of fighters. Sure. Uh, rather than to encourage someone to be who they are, you give them a kind of quite detailed patina of either aggression, you know, of whatever their is the complete opposite of their style. And as soon as that peels off, the opponent suddenly finds himself fighting a wildly different person. Yeah. Uh, in this case, like Alan is someone who has been trained to be a uh, safety first tri star fighter who is, in fact, just a gritty, uh, like, gritty violent dude who is like a brawling maniac yeah yeah and so like people who have peeled past the outer layer have suddenly found themselves in uh like more trouble than they anticipated Mm -hmm. but yeah i think that that outer layer is going to be a is just going to be like problematic for everyone um the wrestling i think this is this is i think where it gets really tricky yes um because as you said like People have been able to get to Bun- uh, to Alan uh, with the wrestling. Uh, like, yeah, Bernal. I think it was also... Um, what's his face? Um, guy with a round of gas. Uh, Mr. Finland. Uh, Amir Khani. Amir Khani, yeah, yeah. I his name. <laughs> um, Mach 1 Amir Khani. Like, yeah, I mean, that, that was a split decision. Yeah. Um, admittedly, you know. Uh, Alan has consistently improved since then, but um, he's mostly someone who's just rather than having ironclad takedown defense, is good at scrambling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, a, a yeah, huge, I a, just a huge weapon for Alan too is just his gas tank. He's mm-hmm. a really, really well conditioned fighter. Um, but then again, this is a quality that Evloev shares. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a yes. fight where Evloev. Uh, does badly late. No, absolutely not. Even, um, even and yeah, in... again, like Dan Ige, also an incredibly durable, incredibly tireless fighter, and if I just put a consistent whooping on him. Yep. Um. Yeah. If this, and that's the thing. Like, if this was a close, start, literally, if this was a close stance matchup, I think I would probably pick Ivluev simply. Simply because 
he has a more consistent pace. But because it isn't, I simply don't think it's going to be there. Yeah. I don't think he's going to be able to enforce the kind of, like, rhythm that he wants to. It really does uh, really rely on the the jab and the lead hand in general. I mean, Evlov has also got a solid left hook. He plays off the jab. It sets up his shots. I will say there are some troubling signs in, like, the brief moments against Diego Lopez when Lopez goes southpaw. It's never long enough to really get a full picture. But you do see of love who is always working off of his jab, suddenly thinking like, I'm going to throw like a, a big out, a big body kick. I'm going to throw this like the first thought in those brief moments is never the jab, which it almost yeah. always is <laughs> in an in an orthodox orthodox uh, stance matchup. Still, though, man, I mean, I've been I've been like waiting for Ivloev to get to this level. And it's not like, it's not even like it was with Allen where he was like kind of struggling with everybody. Yep. Very true. On the way up. Like, and I think some of that is maybe just was his, his game sort of maturing. And I think you're right that there is kind of like, it, it does work to his favor, but there is like an essential disagreement between the guy Allen probably is at heart and the kind of style he was equipped with. Where, you know, a lot of these fights were defined by him, like, sort of trying to keep the opponent contained and, like, not being able to stop them from getting into a real scrap with him. And then it was always his scrappiness that pulled him through. If Lov is just out here, like, dominating most of his opponents, even Diego Lopez, like, that was a, um, a win which has already aged pretty well, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a fight where, like, everyone was impressed with Lopez because he lost so competitively. But, like, he was losing the entire time. He just, like, threw up 90,000 submission attempts, which Evloev defended without fail. Um, and he spent a ton of that fight either with his ass against the fence or on the ground. Evloev was just in control. Uh, of a fundamentally difficult fighter to control for, again, almost the entire fight. And I don't know. Am I really going to pick against him just because I'm assuming he's not going to jab? I'm going to assume that, like, his entire entry game is going to fall apart because I that's just how I feel about MMA fighters now. I mean, it is a I good like rule. Everything about how he gets inside <laughs> to takedowns, I'm, I'm just going to assume it's just going to utterly disintegrate when he he fights someone who has their has their right foot in front of them. But if he has any other ideas, like you can take Allen down. Basically, so I like again, I've in some ways I've been I've been broken. <laughs> uh, Alexander Volkanovsky broke me. Yeah. And I was like, Alexander Volkanovsky is going to jab this man. He's definitely going to jab the southpaw, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he didn't last uh, time, but like, this time, he's definitely going to do it. Yeah. And even, like, despite the own the evidence of my own eyes, having not seen him do it, I was just like, sure, he's going to jab it. Why did I think that? I'm never thinking that again. I'm never having my heart broken again. I'm never going to assume <laughs> that any fighter is going to jab someone or that any fighter is going to have a functional, like, even, like, have... Uh, and he's, he's such a, as you said, he's such a jab-dependent fighter. He is, yeah. I'm just I'm just going to assume that it's not going to be... I there. will never and... learn. You know, I will never truly learn. Mm-hmm. I, I am tempted to take Evloev here. It's That's the thing. It's like, it's, if it's such a big part of your game, surely you wouldn't just throw it out the window, right? <laughs> right? Like, how, in what world does that make sense? Everything you do is about that lead hand. So, like, surely you wouldn't undermine your entire game on the basis that you're fighting a lefty for the first time in ages. Right? Just letting you listen to yourself. <laughs> that can't be. You've seen MMA before. <laughs> Why would you do that? Why is that such common advice? It's the most fucking watered down surface level shit. Like boxing commentators say this. No coach who's worth his salt in boxing tells his fighter not to jab because the opponent is left handed. That would be insane. It's the jab. 
You should use it all the time. <sighs> you are like, in the same way that you were like... I know. You can see Drikus beating Sean Strickland. I was like, yes, I can. You can also see... Yes, uh, I can. I can I can envision you, it. You can see Mofsa Ivlov having this fight, and he, he's going to do... And he does nothing for, like, uh, like, the first 20 seconds. And then he, he will feint his left hand twice and then throw a giant right hand. <sighs> yeah... I can see it. I think it will probably still be close because it's not an Arnold Allen fight. Yeah, that's the, the thing. And have. The, ma- the man cannot have like dominant fights against literally anyone. No. He He's like Leon Edwards. Yeah, he really is. Um, and, you know, like, yeah, it may come down to his scrappiness once again. I mean, we sort of also made the point before we started recording that um, if Loev has a lot of these control tools, but really if the opponent is just down to scrap, he can't really like keep them in a box completely. Um, mm-hmm. He like the, almost immediately in, in that fight with Diego Lopez, he was just having like crazy exchanges. I don't think he minds. I mean, there is an essential scrappiness to Evloev too. You can go back to his like yeah. M- M1 fights and he gets into a lot of crazy, crazy fights back in the day and fights really, really hard, just like Allen always did. Um, yeah, I he, think it's one of the advantages that he has over, like, yeah, yeah, uh, as he, we've said, like Rory McDonald, because he's a maniac. For his weight class, he is simply, yeah, he is simply more durable and like knows it. Yeah, and super confident and super aggressive. Um, mm-hmm. even in his more controlled mode, he is a very he's a fundamentally aggressive fighter. I don't know, man. It's just, it has been a while, but it's like a Strickland thing. Like, it's been a while since I saw Allen just getting taken down a ton. Likewise, it's been a while since I saw him fight somebody who tried to take him down a ton. And literally the last time I saw that matchup, he did get taken down a ton. Yeah, but on the other hand, what if, uh, what if Mavsoev Love is just like, how do I take someone down if their right foot is in front? He's got a lot of ways, though. You know, he he's got a lot of different entries. He he is, uh, you know, he it's not like he does, he never shoots for a single and runs the pipe. Uh, it's not like he can't catch a kick and treetop somebody onto their ass. Like, if Loev is a really complete wrestler and grappler, um, I, I'm gonna pick of Loev. I just I don't know. I, I the guy has been. He he has been had a similarly like long road to get to this point and was more flawless through that than Allen was on his own sort of run to contention. Um Yeah. He, he doesn't get fair. tired. He's probably gonna be the guy commanding the space. He's probably gonna be on the front foot more than Allen. He doesn't get discouraged, even if he's running into a ton of shots like I just and and he's got the wrestling game and it, it's just uh I think it, that that just can be slightly game breaking for Allen who like literally both of the times he was against that I can recall he was against an opponent who really tried to dominate him with wrestling he needed like a miracle comeback to win mm-hmm. it wasn't such a miracle against Makwan Amirkani because that pattern is in that literally, literally always happens every yes. one of his fights but <laughs> still it was like Allen was pretty much losing that fight. Um, and likewise, I think against Mads Brunel. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to take, I'm going to take a love for the, the consistent dogged wrestling game. I just don't see Allen avoiding that, uh, for 15 minutes straight. And I don't think if love's super durable and super aggressive and, and courageous, I just don't see Allen, uh, like sleeping him or something in round three. Yeah. He's not going to uh, submit I mean, him. I'm going to. I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick Alan for if I'm looking utterly perplexed. The idea of fighting someone who's who's southpaw, and then probably also picking up a bunch of takedowns, and then just losing a weird scraper of a decision. <laughs> yeah. To Arnold Allen, because that's how Arnold Allen wins. Where like Alan just starts throwing like multi punch combos and like staggers him towards the end of round three. Sure, could happen. 
Allen is a he is an uncannily competitive fighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's just a born competitor. But yeah, I'll, I'll I'll take the guy who does all the wrestling. Um. Okay. Well, I think that's really all we're going to talk about here. I mean, it's not like this card is without other interesting matchups. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Charles Jordan is taking a weird, like, sort of step down and fighting Sean Woodson, but that does sound like a hilarious and fun fight. Um, yeah, I mean, it's after he got, like, smoked by uh, Julian Rosa. It's uh, mm-hmm. slightly more forgiving. Let's see how you do against a giant person fight. Yep, an even more giant person. Uh, yeah. You know, to that end. Neil Magny, Mike Malott looks like uh, fun. I think maybe Neil Magny mm-hmm. is entering the, the stage of his career where he just gets like fed to more punishing strikers. And uh, the sort of bar for how athletically uh, dominant they need to be uh, gets lower by degrees. Chris Curtis, Mark andre Barrio looks um, pretty cool in a middleweight kind of way. But uh, that's enough for in-depth. I mean, what, what I really want to do to close out this episode, because you, you've had a crazy weekend, Phil. I mean, you yep. you know, there's just been like family emergencies in your circle and in circles connected to your circle. And as a result, you missed out on every single result of Uncle Eye of Walker 2 and, and the rest of the card. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I missed it. Entirely, I basically had to run entirely. I came right from like driving across Europe, uh, basically into heavy hands, uh, and still have not unpacked. And yes, I have not had a chance to watch it at all. So we are going to get your uh, live, unfiltered reaction to some of these results. Um. First of all, I will tell you that Magomed Ankalaya versus Johnny Walker was not as stupid as it could have been. Right. It was pretty stupid. Yay! Um, largely due to Johnny Walker, who sort of came in with no new ideas. He tried to did do... He still, did he maintain <laughs> the idea of pretending like he was hurt? Because that was cool. He didn't do that, actually. He learned his lesson oh. on that front. Um but he did take a sort of a cue from the last guy that uh, Uncle Iyev had to rematch, Iwan Kudalaba. Because as yeah. you may recall, one of the funnier moments in that fight was uh, spinning back fist related. Uh, that was when... Wait a minute, didn't he, wasn't it a spinning front fist? <laughs> Maybe you're right. It was something like, it was something like that. Or it yeah. was just the pimp hand. It was, oh yeah, it was, it was like a back... He, he there threw was the like right a hand slap. And he just threw the back hand. Yeah. <laughs> there was like a spinning back fist. It a, was, a spinning yeah. pimp slap sort of technique. Yeah. Um, Johnny Walker, I think, maybe threw about 13 spinning back fists in this fight. He just kept trying it. It didn't work once. Um, he kept the idea of the low kicks, but they just weren't that effective. Uncle I have one thing I will say. He checked a lot of low kicks. Uh-huh. So he's learned. He's learning, you know. Uh, of course, he's learning in the only way you would expect, which is like to be more defensively sound. I, I, I hate to hate on a guy for becoming more defensively sound, but he certainly didn't look any more offensively potent, which is a major problem for him. Um, but we also got a Johnny Walker sort of insisting on being countered in a in a characteristic way because. He went for this sort of low kick to, like, same hand jab reset move Mm -hmm. at least 35 times. Uh, He was just like, okay, this isn't landing. The low kick is getting blocked, and then the jab isn't landing. But you're not punishing me for this, so I'm just going to keep doing it. And finally, at the end of the fight, Magomed Ankalaya was like, I have to hit you with a right hand. And he did early contender for worst KO of the year. There's something just really stupid and unsatisfying about it, but he does knock Johnny Walker down. I think he flattened his nose. uh, And then hit him with a pretty brutal coffin nail. And uh, Walker was still conscious, but again, I think his nose was absolutely busted by the shot. Really ugly, really stupid. And... um, Fair enough. Yeah. You know what? uh Having, Having, like, looked at three of these terrible divisions... You get the feeling that like there's just a it's like some animating force which just wants the the avatar of 
like these divisions to actually represent their divisions now. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. And that's what's keeping Magomed Ankalaev from any kind of success. Yeah. So it's like, no. He's yeah. like, I'm gonna do it with my with my technical defensive style. I'm like, no, Magomed, be an idiot. That's yeah. what light heavyweights are. I'm sorry, pal. The champion Big, is gonna be people. a giant like, Hulk who either knocks you out or gets knocked out. Sorry, pal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like, John- unless you accept that that's what you should be improving. Like you should, you just start your fights with a with a sacrificial rolling thunder for the gods of light heavyweight. Like you ain't you're never gonna win the belt. Yeah, it's just how it is. Look at look at middleweight. Look at women's bantamweight. Yeah, these like are improbably being ruled by their by their avatars. Yeah, you will spill your blood on the altar of this division, or else. Yeah, you will just have to fight Johnny Walker forever. <laughs> <laughs> that that will be your curse. Yeah, I think you might be right. There's a sort of reordering of the universe happening uh, mm-hmm. in these divisions. Uh, speaking of which, uh, first of all, Jim Miller beat Gabriel Benitez. Wow. He beat him with a submission in the third round. He did a what now? Yeah. He just had a really dogged, insistent, combination punching... Uh, performance which then like halfway through round two he just started blasting benitez off his feet with really well-timed double legs it was like one of the better jim miller performances i've seen he still got it it was like it was his uh it was basically it was the tiago alves fight yeah yep he took that approach and he's probably going to get to fight on ufc 300 because he didn't even take that much damage you got to cut Ooh. Uh, okay, he also uh, outkicked Benitez with low kicks. Like, it was just a really solid showing from Jim Miller. Probably also a bit of a referendum on how aged Benitez is as well. But, uh, you know, Jim Miller's 40 goddamn years old. Like, you don't get a, you don't get a pass for having sort of yeah. lost your prime uh, as an excuse for losing to Jim Miller. Biggest for me, though, Mario Bautista did it. Wow. He actually six, s- Connor. He styled on Ricky Simone. Like he definitively beat Ricky Simone. Uh yeah, I don't know what happened. I did actually pick this one really well. <laughs> did I pick Jim Miller too? <laughs> I, maybe you maybe I, I think you I, cheetah hedged it. I think I, I think did cheetah hedged it. I might have picked one way on this and then another way on the Vivi. Yeah, I couldn't keep it straight, actually. I'm, I recall maybe. that now. But I definitely picked Mario Batista. Mm-hmm. And he absolutely exploited some of the things we saw uh, in Simone's fight with Song Yadong. Just having the reach advantage, using it, it was very much a fight about uh, distance management, initiating with the jab, um, forcing Ricky Simone to overextend and reach and nailing him with counters. But it was also the scrambling, buddy. Yeah, uh, several people were having listened to the episode were hitting me up on Twitter during the fight, being like, "You were, you guys were not kidding about Ricky Simone's wizardry on the ground." Ricky Sim- or Mario Batista's Mario Batista, Ricky Simone just could not keep him down. He got him down a few times. I have to say, mm-hmm. overall, Batista's takedown defense looked pretty strong, but when he did get taken down, he would just find one little area of space and just blast through it and return to his feet very quickly and i think he outpaced ricky simone he looked like max holloway in the third round he was just pressuring him putting combinations on him literally like ricky simone would have liked a much bigger octagon to fight in and you would never have believed that this was like the last guy to beat marab duelish willie because batista was in there looking like the fresher fighter fighting at a much higher pace at the end of the fight. He just straight up Ooh. outclassed Ricky Simone. It was really cool to see. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think like the Rob, the Rob Font fight, as we said, was like yes. the big one where you're, you're like, Rob Font is certainly, as we've seen, able to be controlled from the top position. Yep. Uh, like for entire rounds. And Ricky Simone could not do it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like, he, but that fight was still like close as hell. Yep. But like the Batista was able to like, I mean, even so, you don't like he didn't 
dominate Ricky Simone. He just knocked him out. Yeah, he kind of had him shook for good portions of the fight, yeah, yeah. but he it was still it's Song Yudong, you know. He's going to have a yeah, certain yeah. kind of pace with basically everybody. I'll just tell you the stats right now, uh just to cement the impression and and definitely watch this as soon as you can. Batista outlanded Simone 112 to 45. Wow. He stopped all but 2 of 13 takedown attempts. And only allowed Simone three minutes total of control. I'm sure that also includes time being pressed against the fence. Um, yeah, just a really amazing breakthrough performance from Mario Batista against a, a really special athlete in Ricky Simone. Uh, and then finally, uh, Bruno Fajeda knocked out Phil Halls. Who could have seen that coming? And that is our current, presumably our current front runner for the. Uh... Uh, Darren Elkins versus Michael Johnson predictable yeah by the year of predictable outcomes of the year award absolutely and Waldo Cortez Acosta quote unquote defeated Andre Arlovsky and in the process reminded me and filled me with shame that I that I I forgot to nominate him for worst vibe of the year but him and Roman oh, wait a minute did we not include Roman Delizze for the turnaround Oh my god, we didn't. For the for the the forgiveness yeah. isn't free award. Yeah, Jesus. Fuck, we're Stop idiots. We're idiots. <laughs> but Waldo Cortez Acosta, worst vibe, top contender, because he's in there like showboating and making faces while just like barely, barely beating. Barely Andrei scraping Arlovsky. past like one hundred year old Andre Arlovsky. <laughs> it's just, just the worst he just vibe. Staggers out for every fight under the weight of money. <laughs> That he gets to put on these dreadful fights. My aged spine is just cracking under all these <laughs> fucking stacks and bands. And yeah, Waldo Cortez Acosta is in there sneering at him and like sort of just landing one good punch per round. Ugh. <sighs> Terrible vibe. <laughs> Terrible vibe. Anyway, that, that was all the stuff worth uh, talking about, really, on this card. Uh, a pretty solid fight. I mean, quite a lot of fun and, and quite a lot of weirdness, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sounds good. Yes, I'll have to check out particularly the Batista Simon fight. All right, and uh, hopefully our uh, our uh, listeners got to enjoy a sort of uh, you know less of a discussion, more of just a straight up recap, but a passionate, excited recap for that uh, of uh, last week's card. And I hope you are all looking forward to this weekend's event as much as we are. Not a great pay per view, but then again, the fighters aren't really that great either but they kind of are it, it's it's just got a certain something this card yeah that... it's it's just very characteristic it yeah has a it has a very pure flavor of the divisions and fighters it is representing yeah it's sort of like um i was in chicago one time phil and i i walked into a what i believe was a kazakh restaurant mm-hmm and uh, the looks on the faces of the people who worked there when we four uh, white Midwesterners walked in, they did not – it did not feel like we belonged. <laughs> we, they, we were not welcomed. This is like a place where like presumably a Kazakh diaspora goes to eat and other people don't ever go. And we went in there. They had bottles of ranch dressing just sort of out on the on the tables i don't know if that's food safe or not they served us a drink which was warm salted yogurt cool um it was just a very pure taste of kazakh cuisine and yep. i didn't think it was very good <laughs> but i can appreciate it and i remember it so well all the weird things i ate because i'm like this is yeah indicative this of this kind of style. cuisine and maybe if i got used to it i would learn to love it you know but this is kazakhstan yep this is the so yeah get ready for the pay-per-view that is the taste of warm salty <laughs> yogurt <laughs> <laughs> and ranch dressing warm salty yogurt and gelatinized room temperature ranch dressing uh, this is <laughs> you'll never have anything like it again <laughs> this is middleweight folks this truly is middleweight we'll be back to talk about it next week while uh, also ooh, I can't tell because February is a weird month 
I think we will also be looking forward to, hey, speak of the devil, Roman Delidze versus Nasruddin Imovov. Uh, another great middleweight fight in the main event coming up just around the bend. Until then, hope you guys enjoyed today's show. Uh, find us on Twitter at Evil Greg Jackson, at Boxing Bush. You can find me on Blue Sky at King Typo. And, uh, yep, we'll talk to you next week. Until then, if you came here today for the finer points of Face Punch and you came to the right place, this has been Heavy Hands.